Morning, Carol. Hello. I was very sensible and I had to go home last night, cook dinner, clean the house, mop the floors, all that sort of stuff. Well, you were all having a lovely time on the harbour, so I hope you enjoyed yourselves. <laughs> Um, it's my great pleasure to be here. As some of you will recognise me, I did a couple of workshops at your... Can you hear me, by the way? So, um, some of you came to a couple of workshops that Pauline organised last year, and I really enjoyed the opportunity to work with you in those workshops. So I feel really pleased that I've been asked back to um, give you a couple of sessions today. I have called my session... Um, what have I called it? Come in the Full Circle. That's the theme of your conference. But I'm also called it thinking outside the square. I want to push some of your thinking a little bit beyond what we've been doing. And I know you've had, Ram has said you've made some fantastic progress in the last three years since he's been working with you. But let's look at how we can really push those boundaries a little bit more from today. Um, now, you've all been on your harbour cruise. I know some of you are tired from the late night, not that last glass of red wine you had. <laughs> right, so I thought what we would do to start today's session is something a little bit different to get you thinking in a different way and also to get some oxygen into your brains. <coughs> so you'll all see on your tables there's a white envelope. There are sheets inside there, one each. If you'd like to take a sheet each, and then I will tell you what we will be doing. Alright, has everybody got a sheet? Has everybody got a sheet like this? There's a few spares up here. Now, this is a mini challenge for you. Those of you that have done this before, your challenge is to try and remember how you did it. <laughs> and not to tell the person next to you. So, on that first set of nine dots that you've got there, your challenge is to join all nine dots with one consecutive line. The rules are you cannot take your pen off the page, you cannot double back over a line, and the lines can only intersect once. So I'm going to give you 30 seconds to work out how to do that. Come on, get your brains in gear. The rules are up there on the slide, and no cheating. Ron has failed the test. Okay, what I'm liking is hearing you talking, laughing, thinking this is a waste of time. But what I want to say to you, I want to ask you a question. How many of you have constrained your thinking with this challenge by thinking you have to form a square with the nine dots? All right. We've got someone shaking their head. Thank you. You're thinking outside the square. So here's your solution. Okay? Yeah, everyone go, of course, of course. But immediately, we immediately constrain our view of this to a square formed by the nine dots. So you can see the solution does not form a square. What is the other thing the solution shows you? You can go outside the nine dots. So you're all feeling pretty smart now? <laughs> all right, here's your next challenge. Same thing with the second set of dots, but only three lines. Same rules, but only three lines.
Yes, consecutive lines, so the lines have to all be joined and all and the dots. You can't take your pen off the paper, you can't double back, you can't do a mishmash of, you know, look, making it look like noughts and crosses. Yes. <laughs> all right, you're all a bit quieter this time. Yeah. I'm going to wait for the end. Okay. I'm going to put my brain through it. Let me ask you this. Have you all constrained yourselves by assuming that the lines have to go through the middle of the dot? Okay, have a look at the solution. Oh, yeah. right. Did you get it? Oh, not bad, not yet. Yeah, actually, rum did not fail this time. I'm not good with being outside the box. Okay, so thinking it has to go through the middle of the dot. So you're feeling constrained. Going through the top. So going through the top, middle, and bottom of a dot allows you to draw. Can I? I'm glad you're really interested in this. What I'm saying is you can't crack the solution if you're not thinking differently. So working, drawing at an angle through the top, middle and bottom of the dot and going way beyond that square. Do you agree? You have to go way outside that square to crack the solution. So what I wanted to do today is just annoy you with a challenge that um, you couldn't solve. Um, but what I wanted to say is that the challenge demonstrates that we can sometimes get stuck in our own assumptions and these assumptions actually constrain us. If we don't think differently, we don't do anything differently and therefore our results remain static. And here is one of my favourite quotes, the definition of insanity. I often feel insane and then I think, what am I doing? And so yeah, most of you will have seen this. I'm with Suzanne, by the way, from yesterday, where I'm on that cusp. I sort of need glasses, I sort of don't. So turn, putting them on and off is very annoying. Um, so definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, and you think you're going to get a different result. Michelle yesterday talked about that case study where three times some people have come in to introduce a new system, and they did it the same way and they expected it to work. The fourth per person came in, did it differently, and it worked. So that's kind of what my message is about today, is thinking outside the square, and I want to challenge a couple of assumptions, giving you some food for thought to keep your service operations moving forward. <coughs> um, I agree with your theme of your conference about focusing on getting back to the basics. Um, those concepts and approaches <coughs> have remained, as Pauline and Rum have discussed, valuable and will always be around. It doesn't matter how much hardware and software whiz-bang stuff you put in. Um, if you haven't got the fundamentals in place that underpin your operation, your service delivery, they won't work. My background is in organisational development and I've been engaged with the people and infrastructure within organisations that actually enable successful service. I partner with a specialist service consultancy and they work with organisations to improve the customer experience. So we have quite a nice synergy there. I do the people, the, they do all the servicey technology <coughs> type stuff. A lot of our work is in government and not for profit. So we understand that not everybody is Westpac who can save 400 something of a million on their salary line. We just don't have the resources to do those huge change initiatives um, or you know, put in place major innovation. So it's about being practical on a realistic and manageable scale. So I'm not going to tell you how to do service or run your operations, you are the experts in that. Um, but I'm going to raise a couple of concepts and questions just with the intention of provoking you to think maybe differently. In preparing for the workshops last year, I read this excellent paper um, from IPA, the Institute of Public Administration Australia. Um, I found that there's actually not very much written from a strategic perspective about customer service in the public sector, but this was a good paper. And I think it is really pertinent. Many of the easy wins have already been made, okay, in your sort of sector. Even five years ago, quite a number of councils did not have a customer service contact centre, didn't have a CRM. You've done all the big picture stuff. You have no money and you've got customers who expect more and more and more. So what are you going to do about this? So I'm just going to talk about a range of things to get you thinking and maybe just making those, Rum talked yesterday about 
realise in 10% of your dream. This is an incremental journey for you now. You've all got your customer service charters, you've got this, you've got that. What are you going to do now? Um, so that's um, where I would like to start. We'll talk about performance standards and benchmarking. Okay, I have to just keep checking that I'm doing this right. Okay, benchmarking, put simply, is measures, measures your performance and positions yourself to some other comparison. I don't intend to discuss the intricacies of benchmarking, nor how to use or establish them. Serbo is going to talk to you about KPIs later, and I'm going to defer to his expertise in that regard. I just want to take a slightly different approach. So probably you all use mystery shoppers, you use benchmarking surveys, and you position your operations against others. In this way, your front-end service activities are sampled and rated against standard metrics. Your telephone contact management systems enable you to monitor and report on your standard service centre metrics, things like average speed of answer, longest wait, arrival patterns, call durations, abandonment rates, blah, 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 they're all very familiar to you. I'd like to make the perhaps obvious point, I don't know what's the next on my slide actually. I'd like to make perhaps the obvious point that you are monopoly providers of services to your communities. The implications and drivers of providing services and customer service for you are clearly different to those of a commercial competitive organisation. For you, there are different drivers that determine a range of things. So do, whether you deliver services and customer service well or not well, the amount of money you invest in service, how efficiently and effectively you allocate the resources you have, and how you generate the, the impetus to continually change or whether you just become complacent. As the IPA paper said, your clients are captive and as such are often taken for granted. Your customers can't go elsewhere for better service. They can't be drawn to a more successful competitor like in private enterprise. Your customers may have unrealistic service expectations. They can compliment you or complain about you and more worryingly, they can become resigned and silent in the face of poor service performance. So your challenge Right. Your challenge is to avoid complacency and a monopolistic attitude towards your service performance. Instead, creating and maintaining a culture for continuous improvement and a dynamic to support this. What I suggest this means is that yes, you do actually have to set uh, standards and KPIs and you have to benchmark and mystery shop and all that kind of stuff and you have to position yourself against other councils' performance. But I suggest that just positioning yourself, however successfully against other councils, is not enough these days. People's perceptions of service these days means that increasingly, service is a universal. You are compared and judged against all manner of operations offering services, whether that comparison is reasonable or not. For example, your customer may think, if Amazon can take my order 24-7 and deliver some obscure item sourced in the US and I get it in five days, why on earth does it take two calls and two weeks to get my, my bin replaced? Right? Is that a valid comparison? I have yes, no idea. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So in this way, service is increasingly considered a universal concept and customer expectations are in fact always rising. Some of these expectations clearly might be unreasonable and certainly you don't have bucket loads of money that you can throw at it. I believe you can respond by doing something different. What I think you can do is go beyond simple benchmarking and engage in developing a much deeper, deeper understanding of your customer's behaviours, okay? We're all focused on your behaviours, how quickly you answer the phone and all that but customers' behaviours. By the way, just I see some people writing notes. I bought myself a book recently that was called Beyond Bullet Points. You can see I haven't read it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am put quite a lot of detail on these slides because I will give them to Pauline for your website for people who couldn't be here. So engaging in a much deeper understanding of your customers' behaviours, expectations, and their overall experience of your service performance. So I suggest that you don't let comparative stats and the odd mystery shopper experience alone define the success of your operation. 
Because that's what most of your GMs are doing, aren't they? Oh, God, look, your stats are down here, blah, blah, blah. It's about the customer experience. I believe that you and your team leaders must personally understand what it is like to be a customer interacting with your council. Think about how often you and your team leaders sit side by side with service staff to shadow service interactions. We saw that video from Yum Rum yesterday where people were sitting side by side training newbies, right? Or working with bad performers. Right? Why don't we do it for everybody? And, on the, and I think someone, I can't remember who it was, talked about the underground boss. How fabulous would it be if you could get your GM to sit side by side with the service staff and understand what it is like for the customer? But start with you and your team leaders. This kind of approach is a valuable supplement to your traditional methods of measurement and will provide you with <coughs> current live information in a way that stats, reports, surveys, etc. don't. Because most of the stats and surveys, benchmarking reports, they're out of date by the time they get to you. This is live stuff. And this is one of the methodologies that my partner organisation uses all the time. So here are some questions designed to get you started with this. Firstly, have you clearly, clearly, clearly established an acceptable level of service provision in your organisation? Most of you know what that is for your service centre, but it's a little bit greyer across the organisation. Going back to your people, your contact centre, do you really know what your people say when faced with the same customer question on different occasions? Quite apart from the averages that statistics give you, and they are averages, do you know how consistent the service experience is that you provide? Do your staff really understand and own your internal benchmarks, or do they say, oh, more service centre jargon, I'll just keep my head down, don't bother me? Have you established and documented best practice in customer interaction procedures? This is probably something dear to Tina's heart. And do you train your teams to deliver to that standard? Are you mentoring your staff on the job to comply with this best practice in the first place and then to be truly committed to it? I think Tina yesterday talked about training, but there's a whole range of ways you can deliver, you can develop skill, and that's what she's talking about. And going to a training session is one way, but mentoring, live mentoring is another way, and it's very powerful. And I'd like to ask you whether your team leaders see side-by-side -side mentoring of your staff as a core element of their daily activities. Or is it just for the bad performance, the problem people? Or are they too busy going to meetings? If any of you are familiar with the Six Sigma methodology, you'll understand how important the layer of team leaders is in any kind of change initiative. It's the critical bit. If you're constantly listening to and working with your weakest, and I do not mean bad, your bad performers need to be in the departure lounge, your weakest performers, to mentor them closer to your average performance profile, what do you think happens? The average goes up. And you haven't actually spent any money, you're just asking your team leaders to do their job. Okay, so if you mentor them closer to your performance profile, that average, your service performance bar, will also continually rise. And there you have it, I believe, one of the basics. You haven't spent any money, you can still do your benchmarking and look at your operational stats, but you have a system of tangible, easy and achievable continuous improvement. And for you and your team leaders, you will also develop a deep understanding of your customer experience of your service operation. I believe that you do this as a matter of course and you will identify areas for improvement and you will be able to drive change through incremental improvement. You get this cycle working and the effect will be better than benchmark numbers. You'll have a sustainable culture of improvement. Most of the time, being um, originally from an HR background, most of the time that people get feedback is when they've been naughty. But if you make side-by-side -side mentoring and feedback part of your culture, that is how people are going to learn and grow. And it's not going to cost you any money at all. Okay, I'd like to have a further look at appropriate service levels. And I forgot to take my watch off, so I have no idea how I'm doing all the time. Don't worry about that, yeah. All right, okay. 
If I see him standing over there, I know I'm in trouble. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we all understand about the need, the need to improve customer service and the customer experience in public sector organisations. Funnily enough, there's a lot written about the need to do that, but there's so little re written about how to do it. Um, we all understand that customers have increasing expectations of service levels, turnaround times, accessibility and online functionality. But what do we, personally, as customers, really expect and tolerate? <coughs> you are customer service managers, but you are also customers. So let's have a think about our own experiences. Here are a couple of mine. Recently, I lined up to take advantage of the self-service option in my local supermarket, and I realised that not only was I doing the work that the supermarket used to pay the checkout operators to do, I also had to wait to do the work. So I was waiting to serve myself. And I, and I found, on doing some research, that my wait was longer than the average wait time your customers wait for counter service. So I looked at your 2012 benchmarking report and the average wait time was 123.8 seconds. Right, longer, much shorter than I waited to serve myself because a stupid person in front of me had a whole trolley full. Yes. Okay. I want a discount because I've served myself. Yeah. As I waited eight minutes for my internet service provider to get to my phone call, not resolve my issue, to get to my phone call. I wondered why a local government organisation would get absolutely flogged for that level of service. Your benchmarking report last, last 2012 showed the average wait time was 44.4 seconds, but this was skewed by one very naughty council, without which it would have been 32.9 seconds. Half a minute compared to eight. And you know what? These experiences of mine are with for-profit entities. They can spend more money on customer service and I can take my business elsewhere. Instead, I tolerate it and I even expect it. And that gave me, I started thinking about that, what that means for you guys. So contrast this with a recent experience I had of visiting what I thought was the Roads and Traffic Authority to renew my elderly father's mobility parking permit. We arrived to find that it was no longer the RTA, but the new service, New South Wales, a one-stop shop for almost every state government transaction. And well done, state government, for finally catching up with local government who understood the one-stop shop concept a long time ago. When we arrived at the Service New South Wales office, a concierge greeted us, asked the nature of our inquiry, and gave us the right queue ticket. Still, we braced ourselves for a long way. This was the RTA, after all. But we were pleasantly surprised when the service officer called us within about three minutes. And it was busy, there were heaps of people there. And our transaction was complete in <coughs> photo and payment within about six minutes. <coughs> it's interesting to note that Barry O'Farrell, after the 2011 election, boff, as my 10-year-old son calls him, particularly now he's, you know, drunk his $3,000 bottle of wine to go. Um, so the New South Wales government, after the 2011 election, made service improvement a priority. They created the role of customer service commissioner, which sits in Premier and Cabinet, and they had a dedicated team focusing on this. So my experience at Service New South Wales was not an accident. It was the result of a deliberate focus on understanding customer expectations and designing the experience accordingly. Who wants to go to one office for you know, your business name licence, another office for your driving licence, another office to make your housing commission payment? Someone finally cottoned on to, yeah, just put it all in the one place. You save a lot of rent as well. Um, and so this focus, I think, has been a very um, strategic of theirs, and I reckon it's working. I had a really great nine minutes in service New South Wales. Back to this topic, though. I just put a snapshot here of your 2012 benchmarking reports, report. I don't know that every member council participates in this, and I suggest that you do. I think this is really valuable information. But have a look at that performance. It's pretty good, isn't it? Service level agreements, you're exceeding those 101.3%. That means you're actually exceeding them, not just meeting them. So I reckon that this is a pretty good performance that local councils are coming up with. 
But when is good good enough? Right. This is your problem. In contrast to my earlier comments on universal service and comparisons with Amazon, could you be in danger of setting service standards that in fact over-service your customers, complete, com particularly when you are competing with scarce financial resources? Working within the universal concept of service in local government creates a conundrum for you. You have universal rising expectations which you will never 100% satisfy. You have a captive customer base which must be satisfied and you have no money. So here's your conundrum. Okay, so how do you manage this contradictory position? And what I'm trying to do is get you to think outside your service centre. This is a broader issue in local government. What I think, because I am opinionated and I have soap, multiple soapboxes, I think nurturing this deeper understanding of what your customers e e expect um, requires, is something you need to do, but it also requires a revision of the way we collect and utilise customer feedback. My thoughts are echoed in the IPA paper, which says customer needs, priorities and demands have to be carefully interpreted. We're very busy collecting all this information, but I don't know that we really use it properly. The paper goes on to discuss the value of supplementing standard methods of surveys and mystery shopping by, for example, taking the time to really understand and use the power of conversations happening on social media. That was one example they gave. The concept of real-time views is referred to and it correlates with my sentiment about working more closely with your frontline staff to find out what is really going on. I think it was Suzanne who said yesterday that she doesn't have control of social media in her organisation. Social media is there for customers. Why on earth doesn't the customer service manager have control of it? Outrageous. So given that you work in the context of a monopoly service provider and you've all got your charters and your this and your that, Consider this model of client expectations which I've adapted from the IPA paper. So the examples that it gave was a desirable level of service is your ambulance arrives in 20 minutes, the help is efficient and the staff are sympathetic. That's what we would love to have. What is, what is expected service is the ambulance arrives in 30 minutes and the help is efficient. And they would consider, they, the IPA paper suggests that most of the customers <coughs> would consider that it's adequate service that arrives in 45 minutes. I consider you might be dead, but anyway. <laughs> um, but what, it, what the IPA paper is getting at is your customers have a tolerance zone, right? So that is that level of service that they will in fact find acceptable. And the IPA paper very much stresses that you, you need to find out what that is by service. Okay, so the customer is going to have different, lev different tolerance levels for different public services. And it, it suggests that we need to determine what they are. So you guys, as, as councils, you are a multifunctional organisation. You deliver a wide range of community and municipal services. Um, so what the IPA paper is leading us to think is for each of those different services your customers are going to have different tolerance zones and different expectations. Um, so I was thinking how would we start thinking about this and I've got four questions there. Now the IPA paper talks about desired, what is it, expected and adequate but I think we could rename those to what is unacceptable, what is acceptable and what is exceptional service. What does it look like for each different service interaction? So for example, an ex acceptable turnaround time for a complaint may be 10 days, an exceptional may be five. For a parking permit, it may be five days acceptable, exceptional two days, who knows? Who knows? Who knows what your customers think? You guys should know. And then you take it a step further and find out what your customer's tolerance is for service across the range of interactions. And this is the one I like. How do you differentiate between their wants and needs? Right? Really different concepts there. For example, your customer may want a parking permit on the spot, but they don't actually need that level of service. Right? You can wait a couple of days for a parking permit. Then ask yourselves, do your customers really require exceptional service for all interactions? This is about managing their expectations and that is your job as customer service managers and you can't do that unless you understand what those expectations are. 
And my final point is my favourite one. What are your customers prepared to pay for? Right. I recently received a letter from my local council about a special rate variation application they were making. It was a very good letter. And it went on to say that if the rate variation was not approved, these are the sorts of services that my community would no longer receive. Right? The parks weren't going to be cleaned you know, every week, it was going to be every four weeks or whatever. And I thought it was actually a really good letter because ratepayers really need to know that you get what you pay for. Right? There are not unlimited funds. I know we all raise money from parking infringements and this, that and the other, but your core revenue is from your ratepayers. And how much of that ratepayer pie does your, do your customers want to spend on getting the phone answered really quickly as opposed to having a new community centre built or this, that the other. So put simply, I lost track of my slides. Put simply, don't set a service standard of 15 second wait time because 15 seconds seems fast and everyone else is aspiring to that. When in fact your customers may be quite happy to wait 30 seconds. That's double. It's going to cost you less. Interrogating your data on different interaction types using those four questions will enable you to identify relevant, and I mean relevant is the word here, and sustainable improvement targets that will produce a maximum positive impact on your customers. So what I'm getting at is don't waste your money trying to answer the phone in 10 seconds when your customers are happy to wait 30. Set standards relevant to their expectations and their tolerance zones. I have not moved my internet service provider. I just know every time I ring them, I put the phone on speaker, I make a cup of tea, and you know, I do the put a load of washing on, whatever, whatever. I expect it and I tolerate it. They haven't exactly educated me on this, but anyway. And lastly, on this area of benchmarking and appropriate service levels, and to link to my next theme, I'd just like to touch on the issue of service <coughs> activity versus service effectiveness. Benchmarking your answer speeds, wait times, call durations, resolution rates, and even mystery shopping, we'll do it, it's commonly done, and it can paint a very rosy picture of your service performance. I'd caution that we also need to have a very clear picture of the service activity that produces these results. So, Think about this, if your clients are calling you and answering you within the target 30 seconds or whatever, that's fine and it will reflect well in your statistics. But what if the client is calling because they don't understand how to find something on your website? Because your website is rubbish. It's poorly laid out, there's stuff there that should be there that isn't there. What if they're calling a third time because a previous request hasn't been actioned? Or they don't understand how to fill in the form that you very efficiently sent them before and then ticked first time resolution because you fixed it. Even if you tell them where the information is on the website and in the call and you give yourself another tick for first time resolution, the fact is the client should not have needed to have called you in the first place and probably didn't want to call you. Okay, and how much of this same type of and how much of this same type of call makes up the total activity that your teams are busy with? Are you working hard and producing good stats, but for the wrong reasons? And how much of your activity is tied up in answering unnecessary calls that customers didn't want to have to make anyway? And how much of this activity is actually costing you in terms of your time, your money, and lost opportunity? You could be spending that time doing many other things. So my message is to you not to be seduced into think that, oops, never good with my PowerPoint. I need to read that book. So my message to you is not to be seduced into thinking that measuring and benchmarking your service standards provides a complete and valid picture of your service performance. You also need to understand what is actually happening in your service interactions from your customer's perspective. I think you're really good at looking at it from your perspective, maybe not so much from your customer's perspective. And this might be a new capability in your operation, so put that in your strategic plan. Anyway, once you incorporate the idea into your current practice, it will be easier to make the case for service standards and benchmarks that you think are relevant and appropriate for your service operation, your council and your community. This is, I think, Rum referred to this yesterday. It's about having the information to go back to your executive or your GM with and say, this is actually what's happening. Give me more money. Or no, just because your friend down the road complained that we didn't answer the phone fast enough, not all customers expect that. You need this information 
for that kind of reason, which leads me to about analysis. And this is about the importance of real deep analysis of service activity as an integral part of your service operation, not something that you do once a year or once every three years because the ombudsman's cranky about something coming along to do it to you. I see lots of service activity, <coughs> I see lots of successful numbers, but rarely do I observe a real understanding and focus on exactly what is going on with contact management activity and why it happens. Even more rarely do I see analysis embedded in actual roles in the service centre. No one's actually got total responsibility for this. Job descriptions rarely refer to it. Um, usually, when you want something like this done, you get a consultancy to come in and do it for you. What I mean by analysis doesn't have to be complicated or sophisticated. It comes back down to the theme of getting back to the basics, actually. It's uh, the analysis I'm talking about could be based on systems data, but equally it can be derived from simply sitting with staff who are handling contacts and seeing what actually happens. You may be doing that for training purposes or, may, you know, managing your poor performance, but you don't use the information. It's just an activity. It's not, you're not seeing it as an opportunity to gather all this data together. So here's some ideas and questions for you. Do your systems capture with an appropriate degree of granularity the type of customer requests you see, receive each day? If you, have a request, if you have request type categories that attempt to cover every conceivable, conceivable situation, and I have seen this, that's probably too many for your officers to accurately use or quickly use right when the customer's on the phone. And therefore, it won't provide sufficient categorization to support meaningful analysis. When classifying a contact in your system, I really hope your officers don't say, just hang on a minute while I find the right category. Oh, this is just too hard. I'll just call it one of those. Or worse, I'll just use it other. Right? That other category is so wonderful, isn't it? Conversely, you may have too few categories or the categories are too broad, so you don't have enough detail to know why your customers are contacting you, making it impossible to identify trends over time. And that's the other thing that I have a problem with, with using statistics. It's often, this is what we're doing now. Where's the trend? Where's the differences? Why have those differences occurred this year? So categories like information request or action request with no further detail or free notes that cannot be interrogated are the examples of this. So you might be handling these contacts really well, very satisfactorily, but you simply don't know what they were about and, you, and it doesn't serve to strengthen your analysis. Think about contact types. Think about contact types in terms of the value to your customer and to you. A notification of an illegal dump or graffiti is very useful for council, although I would suggest that all the outdoor workers should be noticing those on there as they're going around, but anyway, um, they are useful for you. Repeat calls following up an unresolved matter are not useful. Understanding your contact types will allow you to set improvement targets with these. Think about whether your customers really want to ring to say, what's your address? Can I pay by credit card? I can't find X on your website or Y on your website doesn't work. <coughs> can you send me this form or how do I do this? So you can easily set targets to reduce or eliminate some of these types of contacts because they are quite frankly annoying for your customer to make and they're not a good use of your resources. So your service officers may find them quite nice contacts because they're easy and you just tick a box, they're done, but they're annoying for the customer. So you could have a whole range of strategies to deal with these type of calls. Improve your rates notices. We now offer credit card payment. Woohoo! Closer monitoring of your website functionality. Frequently asked questions. And there's loads of other things you can do um, in terms of automation. Now the other one that we find a lot in our consulting work is the complex matters, which are long. They tie up your resources. You put customers on hold while more senior staff are consulted or you transfer calls to handle them. And this all creates cues for new callers. And we often forget about new callers. We're so happy that we manage that really complex, difficult situation, blah de blah de blah, not realising that 20 people have backed up while we're doing that. So 
What these sorts of complex matters often suggest is a unclear or poorly designed process. And I think that's something also dear to Tina's heart. I'm really glad to hear that she does uh, process mapping. That is at the, one of the main reasons we get service failures because we know what the process is. So do you need to understand the process and redefine it? Do you need to upscale, upscale your training so you spread knowledge and expertise? Or do you need to introduce a triage process to separate the handling of simple and complex calls? Think of about it as an emergency department. I'm pushing my way <coughs> to the front of the queue because my illness is much worse than the person next to me. But it's the triage concept is now being used more and more in customer service. It may be that, there is, that some matters are so complex that you redesign from your perspective, from a customer service perspective, how you manage them. And you may not choose not to manage them over the phone at all rather than a long, complex conversation that the customer doesn't understand anyway, maybe you can work with your internal service delivery units to design a customer-focused, user-friendly information pack. Or maybe you can agree with whichever department that when I get one of these calls, I'm ringing you and you're going to organise a meeting with that customer. Tick first time resolution, you've got it off your case and the customer's going to feel really happy that it wasn't. I've got to explain this again and again. Finally, find out how many contacts are a result of service failures or errors. Find out how many are repeats or follow-ups resulting from processes, requirements or turnaround times that were simply unclear to your customers. So this is where I'm saying find out about your customer experience. Do you know what is confusing for your customer? I think we all get very organisation centric. So this process seems really good, it's new and it's whiz bang and we put it on the website and this and that. But our customer goes, what? Don't get that. So what I'm asking you to do here is consider um, the following. Avoid a reliance on stats alone, which may not give you a picture of what's actually happening on the front line. Statistics give you averages which may mask wide variations in the quality, accuracy and efficiency of your operation for the individual customer. Enable contact categorisation that reflects accurately what your customers are requesting with appropriate granularity. Embed a routine for repeatedly analysing activity data and identify the low value or unwanted interactions. Then get rid of them somehow. That's part of your strategy and establish best practice interaction processes that your team is committed to and which are used to deliver consistent customer experiences with minimal variation. Analysis is an ongoing focus on and discipline that leads to understanding your real service performance. It allows you to set improvement targets and to design specific strategies to meet them. This approach will allow you to capitalise on those easy wins that the EPA paper talked about and will keep you moving forward. Yesterday, Suzanne gave a very interesting presentation on her channel strategy um, and I really liked her anecdote at the, the start of it. She's obviously a girl after my own heart, like in grape juice with bubbles in it. Um, but what was really interesting about that story is it was one service interaction which led to invoking four different channels. So there was front counter experience, there was an email, there was a phone call, and then there was a face-to-face -face meeting. And what actually the race course did was very well, not only using its channels appropriately, but it really did service <coughs> recovery well. Anyway, I'd like to just have a look at channel management um, and how you can build on some of the things that Suzanne was talking about yesterday. Because channel management used strategically, and I'm not talking about the strategy, I'm actually, once you've got the strategy and implemented it, it's about managing your channels. If you do that properly, you actually will um, improve your service level. Um, so we've talked about your analysis that will give you a clear understanding of how, how customers contact you and how you respond to them. Multiple channels into and out of council represent choice to your customer, but may also create complexity and the potential for inconsistency and confused responsibility. Just as Anne's example yesterday about social media, and Rum asked you about where emails go, and someone said records. Right? I think letters still go to 
um, records in most councils. And the work I do with some councils on customer service, I go, why is a letter different from a phone call? A letter from a customer is service. Why doesn't it come to the service centre? Why can't they put it on trim and blah, blah, blah? And I meet resistance every time. So, so that's what I'm saying, a channel strategy and channel management is all very well, but you've got these underlying issues. So you've got phone, you've got email, you've got mobile apps, you've used Blink, you've got snail mail, you've got the website, you've got web forms, you've got social media, and all those things are going to come out next year that we don't even know about. And they're all useful for different circumstances, but they all present their own challenges. So my four areas um, that I want to talk to you about very briefly are these. So firstly, coherence and coordination. Your channels actually need to form a logical and sustainable range of options. So look for whether there are any gaps in your channels. Are any being underutilised? So you put bucket loads of money into a new channel and then nobody uses it. Why? Is it not logical for what you thought it would be? Have you actually based it on your customer experience and your customer expectations? So think about whether you intend for different channels to be used for different types of in interactions and really interrogate the customer demographics of your LGA. Consider the service levels, response times, and turnaround times across all channels and understand how to manage customer expectations across those channels. So self-service operation, self-service options are actually part of your channel management. Identify who you want to use self-service options and what and for what services. With all of this kind of information and your analysis behind you, a coherent strategy with coordinated implementation, active promotion and rigorous analysis of trends and usage is what you need. Promotion of channels is often really neglected. You whack it in and think, oh yeah, the customer will find it. Um, Rum said yesterday that, what is it, that snap, send, solve, someone developed it, didn't even tell them local government sector that this might be really good and it's the same with our customers who put in this fabulous um, new way to contact us and we put it on the website. What if the customer doesn't use your website? How are they going to know about it? So if we don't identify and then steer your customers through effectively, effective questioning, a really important skill for your customer service officers, if you don't use that to cheer the, steer them to the most appropriate channel, then why bother? So do you ever hear your customer service officers say to a customer, do you use the internet? Yes. Oh, you do, okay. The instructions and requirements for this particular thing you need are all set out there. Give me your email address and I'll send you the link so you can get directly to it. it doesn't cost you any more money. That's great that you're doing that at Hawkesbury. A simple but often found example, and I know you may think this is basic, but it's so common, is that we have all rushed to put our forms on our website, have we not? So you no longer have to ring up and say, can I have a form for blah de blah And we don't always consider that the customer actually has to print those forms off, fill them in manually, scan them, or put them in an envelope, put a stamp on it and mail it to you, and then you deal with a manual mail item that may go to records instead of you. Um, so you might find that your customers cannot be bothered. It's easier to ring you up or go to the front counter and get you to do the work because you've made it too much effort for them. So your strategies to overcome this might be online self-editing web forms with pop-up customer guidance notes. Okay, taking it a step further. I had... Um, been one of those. I'm actually going to run out of time, so I won't tell you that. Um, so consistency. Do you need the same standards um, of performance and response times across all channels? Do you? We consider often, well, we better, but you need to really interrogate that. Um, think, for example, in terms of consistency, and again, I think this is a very basic example, but I come across it time and time again. The forms at the front desk. Are they the same as on the website? Do they look the same? Are they the same version? Um, think about um, response times on all channels. Should, should they be the same? What does your customer think? If I send you an email, do I have a right to expect it to be answered as quickly as my phone call? So, sorry? 
I know, so your letter's different. So I might write to you for X, or I might email you on the same matter, or I can phone you. Because I bother to pick up the phone, I get a better level of service. Is that right? I don't think it is, but what does your customer think? Have you considered, a, a, as I said, respo appropriate response times for emails received outside business hours? I've sent my email 8 o'clock at night and your turnaround time is three days. When does the three days start? And why is it three days when I can phone you tomorrow morning, wait 30 seconds and talk to someone? So simple issues, but often overlooked. Another example about consistency. Have you considered how to respond to a complaint or negative comment posted on social media. Who monitors this and how frequently? Does such an incident invoke your standard complaint handling procedure? If not, why not, should it? Is there an inequity if I complain in writing and address it to the mayor as opposed to saying something really horrid about you on social media? It's an emerging area. We're all rushing off to have our channel strategy and we're getting very excited that we can do this, that and the other. And it's a bit like, you know, building a new house and being very proud of it and then you realise you've got to clean it and paint it and, you know, all that kind of boring stuff. And management of your multiple channels um, is something that we do sometimes think, not think of when we're putting our strategy together. So the first thing is obviously someone, someone, probably you, has to ensure that the experience is consistent across all channels. It's a relatively new role in our organisational structures and it needs to be clearly defined. Rum was talking about accountability yesterday. Who is accountable for the consistency of your customer service experience? Someone has to control service related content across all channels. For example, introducing new or updated information simultaneously or removing outdated material. Someone has to analyse the reliability of all channels and develop contingency strategies if a channel should fail. So, two, two minutes, three minutes, okay. So, if your website goes down, are you prepared for call spikes? Who will tell you if your website's gone down and how quickly? And then you need to manage the impact on your staffing and rostering. I am not going to bore you too much with analysis because we did cover that. But a couple of points there. We don't analyse everything on all channels. We're very good at analysing front desk and phone calls. So this is a new area. Okay, so in essence, you need to have a channel strategy that includes channel management. Very quickly, opportunity for collaboration. This is a fantastic example of collaboration, this network. You all do roughly the same thing within your organisations, which all do roughly the same thing for its communities. Therefore, you all have the same issues and challenges and you're all looking for the same solutions. So I'm suggesting that you don't reinvent the wheel. I'm not going to go into this in detail because he's given me the... <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but I did just want to say one... I'll cut this down, but I did want to say one thing in my, my work as in organisational development. I've always thought that a customer service manager actually has to have a really wide range of skills. So you have to be exceptional with customers, right? Because you're head of customer service, so you have to walk the talk. You have to be really good with customers. You need to be good leaders to champion the cause internally. You need to be persuasive when competing for budget. You have to be good managers as well. You need to have your heads around technology. You have to be good with data. So why not pool your talent, share your strengths and get support for your gaps or weaker areas? And this network is a fantastic way to start. All right, am I finished now? Can I talk about people for one minute? Go ahead. The people element, I hope you like my gender equal poster. <laughs> <laughs> it's also something else, it's also eventually diverse. Yes, I know. So we don't talk about this, God, we went to it's probably racially diverse. One of them has a disability and probably one of them is gay. Well, there you go. <laughs> okay. So my, my passion...
question is around the people and your team. So your people, your teams. And here are a couple of suggestions, very quickly, if I can still, 90 seconds. Look at your council's workforce plan. Your HR department will have one. What does it say about the profile of your workforce? As we said yesterday, most of us are facing the prospect of replacing retiring workers with new and younger talent, and that is in short supply. So this represents an opportunity to define what you really need in terms of skills, and more importantly, because skills can be acquired, just ask Tina, um, innate behaviours. What innate behaviours are you looking for? So have you thought about these, the skills and behaviours that will really drive your service operation to new heights and how you can tap into the talent that younger generations will bring you? Suzanne has already cottoned on to that with her gun team for web chat. That's an excellent initiative and she'll be able to spread that expertise once it's embedded um, initially. So think about younger generations and their total comfort with emerging technologies. I've had my two-year-old nephew staying with me and his mother says, you want to watch Sesame Street? And he goes, yes. And he goes and gets the iPad, he swipes it, he puts the passcode in, he finds Sesame Street and he turns the volume up really loud. So I go and turn the volume down and he turns it up and I turn it down. He's two. That's amazing. So they're totally comfortable with technology. They have never known life without the internet. Um, so use that technology to write your specifications for systems changes. Use that to test new systems and enhance them, enhancements. Why does ICT have to do all of that? They don't understand customers. Um, and then, you know, Rum touched on this yesterday. It's about how you attract younger people. What's in it for them? Um, I quite like his strategy of the exit date, but from, from an HR perspective, I do have a slight problem with that. Yeah. <laughs> And don't forget our education system is producing workers who are trained to analyse, research, make sense of those huge amounts of data that Michelle scared us with yesterday. Um, they are taught to problem solve at school and they're taught to work collaboratively. So are you actively looking for these skills at recruitment stage and how do you build them into your service operation? You can allocate defined activities to these people with things like, right, you're responsible for data analysis, you can do the design the reports, you can go and talk to ICT because you understand their lingo and you've got good collaboration skills. Um, and just you can go and talk to the comms team because you understand about communication. Are you doing that? So I suggest that you need to think about designing the customer service job for the medium to longer term now. Uh, work with HR now. What are your job descriptions going to look like? Is it all the same, you know, answer the phone and handle this and ensure that? Or is it going to be something more exciting that's going to engage the people who are more technology savvy? How are you going to reward and recognise these people? That's probably going to have to be different to how we do it now. Um, and we've been, I've been talking probably a little bit too much about sitting side by side with your staff and understanding the customer experience, but are you using that data to give individual feedback, cascade it down to the individual level, that you're doing a really good job or whatever, or do you still have the collective pat on the back for the customer service department? And Ram spoke, touched on this a little bit yesterday. You have good, experienced people in your teams. How are you going to support them through this transition? If they only have on their professional development plan this year, go to refresher EEO training, oh, it's not going to help them. Um, support them through this journey, recognise and celebrate their contribution, and help them find new challenges with dignity and support. All right, thank you very much. Thanks for watching our broadcast on the National Local Government Customer Service Network channel. I hope you got lots of hints and tips and tricks that you can use at your council. The case studies were great, the information's been great, I hope you're enjoying it, and don't forget to visit our website. See you next time.